Hey, good morning, everybody. It's Saturday. Um, it's a little more calm in the shop. Dylan and Peter aren't here. Sean's not here. Uh, so it's just me and Dylan. Dylan's working on, um, he's wrapping up Old Yeller. Um, it's getting ready to go to Boris up at Street Machinery. Those guys are gonna do the patina paint matching. So he's in here this morning just wrapping up a couple little things on the body before we can ship that truck. So I figured I'd show you around a couple of the projects that we're involved with right now. This won't necessarily be a full uh, walkthrough Friday situation, but uh, there'll be a couple cool builds that I'm gonna show you around on. So that's Old Yeller. Uh, like I said, we're, we're pretty much wrapped up on all the body stuff so we can go get painted, or not painted, but the patina paint matching. So uh, running the AC lines through over here. Um, so on the inside of the wiper cowl, we've got an access port and a cover that we make so the hoses can go all the way through. Um, we wanted to keep this firewall pretty minimalistic. Um, no fancy modifications. Um, so just smoothed out where the old heater box used to be. There was some holes up here we filled in. Um, my theory or the concept behind what I want to do with this firewall is blend in all the patina, even try to leave some of these chalk marks that are kind of faded out and still in the firewall. Um, we wanted to move the motor back as far as we could um, and set it down. So we've kind of reshaped this side of the firewall and made a little uh, spot for this valve cover so it can come off. Um, we've got a shortened column. Um, we sell these from I did it. I did it shortens these for us a little extra so we can um, fit the steering intermediate shaft. Um, it's got our pedal assembly in it. It's got one of our new finishing plates. It's just to kind of trim and finish up the firewall and give that a nice touch. But um, where the e-brake cable used to come through and some of this other stuff, we welded that up. So Boris and those guys up there are gonna blend in all the patina paint. And a little cool thing we're gonna do is um, with a black chalk mark, we're gonna come in here and, and kind of quickly put an L7 uh, kind of in this firewall. It's like a little hidden touch. So, um, so that's what's going on in the engine bay. Um, we're gonna, well, all that we did here is same thing, little subtle touches, just like any of the you know the nuts that were welded or thread starts that were welded in the top of the core support for the for the factory radiator we just welded that stuff up and smoothed it out just to look like the factory never never drilled those holes because we mount our radiators and attach them from the back um and then uh, you guys have seen before where they shortened the bed for the ice shop shortened the bed for us and did the rockers all that stuff's ready to go um Somebody put a CD player in it back in the day, so we smoothed out the dash where they could, we can put a factory style radio back in it. Um, T56 Magnum's in it. It's got our extended high hump cover. So I don't know if I've shown these on the channel before, but our high hump cover goes all the way back to the seat rail to completely cover up a T56. Um, so that's in. Um, we're gonna paint this column brown like it was from the factory, make it look like an original column. Um, Dylan's got the bed floor done. He's in here putting a little bit of seam, excuse me, seam sealer in this morning, but um, this bed floor is raised up exactly four inches. And I know I, I kind of alluded before as to putting a video together to show you how we do this. And I think that I will definitely do that. Maybe not today, uh, but we're definitely gonna go through and show you exactly how we've taken this AMD floor and AMD's wider wheel tubs and moved it all up four inches. And I think it'll be a really cool instructional video that shows you really how simple, you, now you're gonna have to be able to weld, but how simple it is to move these bed floors up in a 67 to 72 truck. So anyways, this is all done. You can see where the bottom of the, the we've extended the, the back plate of the bed four inches down too. So when the tailgate's down, there's not a big hole or you know a gap there. Um, but anyways, another thing that you got to do when you move these bed floors up is you got to modify the tailgate. I'll see if I can flip this tailgate over real quick. Good timing. But the factor, from the factory, this rib goes all the way down and all the way across here, and the bed floor sits right below it. So even these have this angle here so that when you open the tailgate and close the tailgate, this sits right here, this bead sits just above the bed floor. When you move that bed floor up, you gotta, this is gonna hit. Um, the only thing you could do without doing this would be to move the tailgate out a ridiculous amount and it would look dumb. But what we do is um, we cut this section out and man, you can't just cut this whole thing out all in once. You're gonna kinda come in here and cut out a section of it, weld in a flat plate, go to the other side and kinda come back and forth before you get uh, 
all that filled in with flat plate. But we just kind of hammer and dolly this around to where it looks like the factory stopped it there. Uh, but anyways, that's something you gotta do. So we're gonna blend in that paint too. But anyways, Old Yeller, man, it's uh, pretty much ready to go up street machine or get the patina uh, blended in. So really pumped to see how cool this truck's gonna look when it gets back from those guys. So pumped on that. Um, today, I'm gonna walk around this a little bit and uh, I'm gonna wrap up some of the hard lines for the brake system uh, while you guys are uh, on, the, on the video with me. So some of the things that's been done, well, I guess there's a, probably a lot of things that have been done since the last time I showed you guys uh, this OBS project. So I'm gonna, I guess, start from scratch. Maybe uh, last time we had done all the boxing plates. Um, so all the boxing's done. We filed and sanded and smoothed all our welds where it looks, you know, like a, a formed rail. Um, got the notches in. And you can see where I'm at today. I'm actually working on this brake hard line, um, finishing up that rear line. So I've put the bulkheads in, you know, where the 3 a and hard line can go in. Um, motor and trans are in. Um, in earlier videos, you guys saw where somebody had hacked the crap out of this frame rail to put an AC compressor. Man, this, this was all gone. It was unbelievable how much they removed from the frame. Well, when we put the frame on, we squared it up, treated it up, make sure it was level. And then um, Dylan and Peter sectioned out this, this uh, subframe. So they took a brand new, well not brand new, but a, a donor frame and they scalloped it, they scalped it. They took the top plate off, removed it, took our top plate off, removed it, sectioned in all this stuff, smoothed out the welds, and then put the, the frame, the subframe cap back on top and burned it all in. So now that that got all smoothed out, where you can't tell anything's been done, um, we put this Concept One accessory drive on. And man, they are, I think that these guys are the only people making an accessory drive specific to an LS9 engine. And uh, honestly, man, we got really lucky. The way they've laid this out, <laughs> fit this OBS frame perfect. Uh, well, not perfect, but dang near perfect. The only thing we had to do was change the outlet of the thermostat. So we've got plenty of clearance under here for a hose and a clamp. The idler, or excuse me, the tensioner for the uh, blower belt fits totally fine. Uh, man, it's like this accessory drive was built for this OBS. And why these are so unique, um, they've got just a crazy shape, man. So the engineers knew they needed to put this here, so I guess they just thought it was a great idea just to swing the frame in to locate this. Well, not only is, is the shape of the frame up here weird, but they take the motors and transmissions and they move them off center a full inch to the passenger side, which is fine, um, but that's when you get into all this kind of um, clearance issue over here. So knowing that the engines are over one inch, you know, we also have to consider that for um, getting our rear end placed and in line and uh, getting the transmission also, that transmission mount offside one, one inch. And from the factory, the only reason that I know of that they did that was just to clear the steering shaft. So, you know, all the way up into 19, well, let's just say all through the square bodies, they had um, the steering boxes on the outside of the frame. Um, so then they changed to more of a car style inside the frame box and they needed, they needed the room for the steering shaft. So they, they just moved the motor out of the way a little bit. So that's why I think they moved the motors over to kind of compensate for the weight. They put the frames or the, the fuel tanks on this side too. So if you, if you look at a, a rear end too, like when we pulled that 14 bolt out, if you measure the rear ends, the, the pinion is, is offset too. Um, so those are all things that they gotta be considered. So, and we always, with a nine inch, we offset the pinion um, a little extra too. We, we go about three eighths or half inch off um, this line so that we do have some misalignment in the drive shaft from left to right. So this pinion um, is actually one and a half inches to the passenger side from center line of the frame. And so that's perfect for drive shaft angle here. And then we've got the rear end mocked up at ride height. And so now we can set up, set all our pinion angles and put the drive shaft in and get all that set fine. Once we set all the pinion angles correct, then I can actually finish my CAD drawings of this big inner stiffener we're gonna build. So we're gonna build a giant inner stiffener that welds in and it's actually going to incorporate the transmission mount for that BMW dual clutch trans and it'll have the torque arm uh, pivot location in it as well. So we'll be able to move the, the pivot uh, for the torque arm up and down and, and it'll be slotted from left to right a little bit too. So 
once uh once we get all the pinion angles done there we can finish our cad drawing and have all that stuff water jetted and broke so we can go ahead and weld it in but um i guess the rest of the stuff you see here uh, is all the uh, stainless hard lines for the fuel system um the regulators there and then we can feed a dash eight to the to the fuel rails there but this is all that earl's um, stainless steel hard line uh did half inch and three eighths uh, on that stuff and it's all it's all real nice it's all bent really really clean um got our battery box and an anti-gravity battery mounted here um and uh that stuff looks good and the fuel lines can run behind it uh, bulkheads back there for the fuel and then we're going to put a fuel tank um in the rear of this truck so anyways that's uh that's where we're at on some of these things um hang out with me a little bit and uh watch me finish up this brake hard line um and uh I guess that's it for what's going on with these two trucks. Um, next video, we'll probably come back and we're gonna cover what's going on with Tim Tyler. Tim Tyler's truck is that 84 that's at the body shop. Maybe we'll put a little image in here of uh, the rendering of that truck, but the body shop is dang near done with it. So we went ahead and ran up to the, to the body shop and got the frame. We're gonna powder coat that and put it, um, put it all back together and take it to the body shop. So anyways, next, next video, we're gonna go over what's going on with Tim's truck. John Schaefer's truck is getting very close. All the bed stuff is done. If you look on our shelves from media, you'll have seen some of the woodwork and cabinetry work that we've done in that bed. It's come along real cool, but uh, anyways, let's, let's finish up that brake line. Hey, if you guys wanna, if you wanna see how uh, we do this dash three plumbing, um, I'll kind of go through that real quick, but um, let's see if this is a good angle. Yeah, that looks all right. So we use, um, annealed stainless hard line uh, it's annealed and it's softer it's more more pliable easier to flare um, <clears throat> so that's the hard line we use um maybe you get that stuff from summit all-star man everybody and their brother makes makes that stuff so that uh and then for termination we do not not double um not your typical like double flare you know that like would come on like a auto zone brake line but we do a, a 37 degree jic flare um and when we use a dash three in tube nut and tube sleeve and this is just a, a pretty much a backer uh for the flare so once you flare it the this the sleeve goes behind the flare and then the nut just tightens up securely against that uh 3an fitting so i'll show you guys how to do that so this is kind of one of the more uh this is like the highest quality primitive bender but um these are simple man you just put the line in there flush it up squeeze it tighten this up and it clamps it together and holds it and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna spare you but you pretty much just tighten this up it'll flare it you back it out and you're done uh, Eastwood makes the the best bender i just don't have the 37 degree dies right now um i did order them but i don't have them now um so these are the one this is the one we use for now all right so i put the flare on the end of that you can see the tube sleeve just backs up against it and that allows the nut to tighten the hard line up against the an fitting pretty simple so next all we got to do is just make the bins extremely precisely where they need to be or you just trash this stainless hard line um so a lot of times what i like to do um if i know that in the frame rail i've got to move like vertically or horizontally a, a specific distance i measure that distance and then i lay it out on the table like you can see here that like i had to move an inch and seven eighths um on the rail so you can see that i went in there or went on the table and marked that so i can line up the tube and then know that once I've got the bends in it, it needs to line up with that line. <clears throat> this here is a bend in the frame. So this was, let's say it's 15 degrees. So when I did this hard line, I just laid my, my protractor in here and measured that this is 15 degrees. And so that whenever I, excuse me, laid this out on the table, I laid a 15 degree line on there. So then I knew that when I made my first bend, it needed to be at 15 degrees and then i needed to be able to move up that amount of distance before i bent it again so that's just a little trick 
lay it out on a table, it's better than just guessing, right? <clears throat> so my first bend, I wanna, I wanna mirror how I bent off that bulkhead. When I came into that bulkhead, I stepped up off the frame to, to catch it. And I don't want this bend to look any different than that bend. So I wanna get back onto the, uh, lined up on the frame rail or flush against the frame rail in the exact same manner that I came into that bulkhead. So now I'm just gonna take some uh, cardboard and a Sharpie and I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw or trace that hard line so I get my other hard line to look exactly like it. Well, I'm gonna put this down because I can't hold it. So it's pretty simple. So now I just know that that's where the uh, termination is on the end. And then this is how back, how far back in that tube the, those bends are. And then so when I bend this new tube, all you gotta do is just lay it out to match, uh, just lay that line on top of this one. Super easy. Well, I say it's easy. So when you guys bend tube, there's always um, a part of the of the tube where the where the bend is going to start you know so it's a zero point of, of of the bend so it's not as important on 316s because this radius is so tight um you, you're, it's going to be hard to kind of mess up where you start and stop you'd have to mess it up by like an inch um but like if you're bending big half inch stuff you know that rate the radius on that die is probably an inch and a half or something so you'll have to a lot of times, if you wanna get something nailed dead on, um, just get you a scrap piece of that tube, put a Sharpie mark on it, and line that Sharpie mark up with your zero degree and lock it down, and then just pull pull a 90 on that tube, and then it'll show you, um, hey, if I'm gonna bend this next bend 45 degrees, I need to know where to start the bend. So then all you gotta do is take that scrap piece of tube line your Sharpie mark up, or line the bend up where you want it to bend, and transfer your Sharpie mark onto your actual piece that you're gonna bend. And then it'll, it'll lay the bend out exactly where you want it to go. Oh, always remember to put the tube nut and tube sleeve on first, so you'll never get it back on. Well, I messed up and I put that bend too close, so gives me a good opportunity to teach you something about messing up. Rubber mallet, um, on this smaller line, it's easy to do this. You ain't gonna, you're not gonna mess the line up too much. Um, but if, if you got like 90% of the way through this hard line and you messed up, um, man, you don't wanna restart. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll just lay that hard line out and you can just slowly persuade the bend back out of it. If you hit it hard, you're gonna collapse the tube, but if you slowly persuade it, you'll straighten it out. So it lands right on my template that I made, so I'm really happy about that. All right, I'm gonna go to the frame and uh, start line, getting a, getting a nice straight line, and I'll start clamping on the frame and then when I get to a point where I want to start bending, I'll make that mark, unclamp it, bend it, clamp it back, and I'm just gonna keep working like that. So this line um, is interfering with all kinds of stuff up here. So before I can even mount it here and start to lay out its straight point, I'm gonna have to get it get it out of the way. So what I'm gonna do is set my length, rotate this line where it needs to be, then I'm gonna come in here and where this, where this starts to bend, I'm gonna put a mark in here so that I can bend this line out of the way. So we'll do that just so we can kind of get started. So if you guys don't have tools like angle finders 
Um, you can you could use a Sharpie and trace that on the table too, but uh, you can also go to like Home Depot and get this for probably like mm -hmm. 10 bucks. So I would just do that. Okay, I kind of just went back and forth with that line a few times. And all I was trying to do was get that initial um, offset from the bulkhead back to the frame level. Um, just trying to get that dialed in and then trying to get ourselves room to bend inside the frame. So now what I want to do is go ahead and start securing this line um, straight down through here. Um, I just like to simply use um, a straight edge and make marks uh, with a marker and then drill and tap them. Another way that I have done in the past before is I've got one of those lasers for like hanging pictures that I can set up and I can shoot a straight line down it. And that's pretty cool because you can line that hard line up like really, really good. Um, and it just kind of takes some time to set the laser up and get all that right. Uh, just a little bit of waste of time in my opinion. So here we go. We're gonna start um, putting these clamps on. So these are the clamps that I use. They're the cheapest. Um, they're like ridiculously cheap. They're from All Star. They're an 18 320, come in a pack of four. These are for 316 or dash three line. Um, they're aluminum. You can anodize them, you can powder coat them. You can leave them alone, whatever you want. But they're, um, they're not the only clamp, but they are my favorite because they are good and cheap. So this frame has got a, like a rise to it. So I'm not gonna measure off that. That's not gonna be my reference measurement. I'm gonna reference from the bottom of the frame. Ugh. Sorry, I'm old. The bolts that come with these are 832. So all you need is an 832 tap and an eighth inch drill bit. Uh, so I usually keep a countersink bit to clean it up. Uh, I lost it. So just use the countersink bit to chamfer the hole. Just kind of step back and, and eyeball it. And uh, if it's got any waviness to it, all you got to do is just go in there and kind of manipulate, you know, with your hands. Um, all you got to do is just kind of hold and tweak and hold and tweak and, and you get it razor straight. But anyways, I'm going to go ahead and finish that up and I'll show you what it looks like when I'm done.